and it's uh, and boom, we are live with Fred Begun, fellow Gator, tw over twenty years of experience. I read Tamir PowerPoint, twenty seven years of experience, and uh, an attorney, a veteran attorney. I don't want to push any niche towards you because you've covered so many, and even though you've entered into family law and so forth. Um, like from looking at your resume that you've done it all right from the say to well i've over the years i've uh, dabbled in a few of the things you get experience and then you figure out uh, which way you go i've been practicing for about 28 years now starting off with um, insurance defense and personal injury work doing business and real estate and construction defect work um, financial uh, fraud litigation as well corporate litigation but then uh, at a certain point in my career, about 18 years ago, I shifted over to doing uh, family law almost exclusively. And then I added uh, estate planning to my practice uh, a number right. of years ago. Um, when the economy changed a little bit, even family law can have a downturn. People couldn't afford mm -hmm. to get divorced. <laughs> and so it was time to make a change. And it's Cheaper to stay separated. Uh, well, it's cheaper to keep her, as the old song goes. <laughs> um, but uh, literally, that, that's sort of the... The changes in the economy can change your practice, and so that's what I do now. I do family law and estate planning uh, with the law offices of Morton Petrini, which is more of a uh, defense and civil litigation firm. So we've got offices all over the state uh, that do all kinds of different areas of law, but my emphasis is estate planning and family law. Awesome, awesome. And uh, I'm completely biased, uh, disclaimer, because... Uh, is also a San Francisco State Gator, but he got his law degree at Santa Clara University. Go Broncos! Uh, the uh, only reason I trust him in my life is because <laughs> fellow Gators, if you're watching this, I got a lot of my buddy uh, uh, athletes uh, on there as well. But well, let's um, be clear: San Francisco State Gators, not that Florida <laughs> stuff. Exactly, exactly. Uh, so, so where do we start? There's so many things we could uh, uh, talk about, but I'm trying to think in the uh, audience's mind uh, and not my own selfish mind. It doesn't matter whether, in my opinion, whether we talk about um, real estate uh, or not. But um, I think the most important thing that you know, I was talking to one of my clients about was how you helped my family out with as far as talking about uh, these umbrella shields and why they're so important. And then next we can go to um, estate planning because I think, you know, obviously you've seen it yourself is uh, we don't prepare for the worst and we were not realistic when uh, we should and how that can really help. But Back to like the business side of things, as far as how um, you know, I'm I'm going through titles, and uh, majority will not say family trust, irrevocable or non uh, or irrevocable um, for somebody who has no idea um, what exactly is a trust and how does okay. that help them in California. Well, look, I, I prefer to step back one notch, okay, because I like to talk about the idea of estate plans. Now, an estate plan really is uh, an overall package that you use to sort of govern your life and end-of-life issues. An estate plan really has four major documents. The first one is a will, second is a trust, third is an advanced health care directive, and the fourth is a power of attorney. Each of them serve different functions. Um, it used to be that trusts existed as tools to tax manage upon death. That's sort of the origin of it. But, um, you know, trusts nowadays, because the tax laws have changed, um, quick story, back in 2010, Congress didn't have its act together, and that year there was no state tax. Mm. And their argument was always, you know, we want to tax more, we want to tax less. They didn't do it. Coincidentally, that was the same year that George Steinbrenner, the owner of the New York Yankees, very wealthy person, died. Mm. Family couldn't have pushed him off a bridge in a better year because there was no taxes that year. But now Congress has its act together, I think, and they have a personal estate tax um, minimum of $5 million. So unless you're worth more than $5 million, you don't have the same degree of uh, tax planning that you used to have. Mm -hmm. And so the trust now functions a little bit differently. Unless you're trying to manage money forward right. and shelter, um, you're really looking at managing money now mm -hmm. and then making a lot of other decisions in the end of life arena. Um, so that was more to answer your question about a trust, but let me also say that, um, you know, I mentioned also wills and health care directives and powers of attorney. A will is a very simple document. 
basically you're telling the world that you're of sound mind, mm -hmm. that you know your people and you know your stuff and you want your stuff to go to your people. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's what it does. It serves the added purpose of having a will and dying. Um, your your money and and property can be passed on to your you know, friends, family, charities, whatever, um, and avoid probate. Mm -hmm. Probate is where you have to take the fact of your death into the court system. If you don't have a will, you have to have the court approve of what's happening with your things going to your people. Right. That can be very time uh, consumpting. Mm -hmm. um, that can also be very costly. Mm -hmm. As an example, um, there are statutory fees for uh, probating someone's estate. Mm -hmm. um, and I was looking at numbers, you know, this is San Jose. It's not hard for someone to be worth $2 million. Mm -hmm. You have an a, a average house, I think I saw on the news this morning, 1.3 million. Right. It was the median price of a house in the South Bay. So to be worth $2 million is not too hard to imagine. Yeah. Um, if you were worth $2 million upon death, you'd have a $22,000 statutory fee. Mm -hmm. Whereas you can get an estate plan done for a couple thousand dollars. Right. Granted, you're dead. You don't care. Mm -hmm. But why should your family waste $22,000 right. that you don't have to? By simply having a will. Yeah, I remember my dad mentioning that at young ages. Uh, he had a blurred with, with taxes or whatnot, but he had a friend, obviously, that passed away. And uh, you know, his biggest concern was, you know, if th things are going to be taxed and according to how much you've made. And if, if you know, we planned six-month emergency uh, expensive, but that might not be enough, yep. right? But uh, failing to plan is, is planning to fail. And that's why, you know, after reading that, I was uh, the first time when I met you and brought my family in and it really... Uh, kind of felt good because it's not the you know the easiest conversation my dad hey so dad mom so when you die make sure let's make sure we're all prepared exactly. you know, but it, it's not about that it's it's about doing the right things the right way how does that tie into um, power uh, of attorney because it's running through my head as, mm -hmm. as you know my grandfather's 96 so for I might one day um, I had uh, you know, I don't want to mention any names but another friend who's concerned between um, siblings have to make decisions for their right. father and, and you know three of the siblings are, are, are arguing you know keep doing what you got to do to keep alive when two other siblings are saying listen he's in pain right now yeah. he needs uh, you know you, I don't want um, they're to make the decision of whether to put a tube down his throat and force feed yeah. him and at that point you know two siblings saying you know uh, dad told me that he does not want right to start tearing open things um, so let me answer that question sure, for sure okay Again, I mentioned those four documents. The will and the trust are documents that are important more upon your death. The advanced health care directive and the power of attorney are more important during the end of your life. Okay, so imagine this scenario like you're talking about where you have a person, doesn't even have to be an old person nowadays, we've heard about young people having terminal illnesses, where you simply need someone else to have the power to make decisions. Now, both an advanced health care directive and power of attorney are technically powers of attorney, where you're giving somebody else the power to make decisions for you on the condition that you are not able to communicate your desires at that point in time. So a power of attorney, also referred to as a financial power of attorney, is where you say, okay, I'm going to have Roman as my power of attorney holder, and he will be making financial decisions for me. That will happen upon a determination that I no longer have the mental capacity to do that. Right. I could make that decision because I'm old and weak and tired and I simply want my grandchild, my child, somebody, brother, sister, cousin, right. a trusted person to make financial decisions for me. I want you to make my investments. I want you to manage my real estate. Right. I want you to pay my bills. Right. Okay. You're a glorified bookkeeper, but I'm imbuing a ton of trust in you. Right. The Advanced Healthcare Directive does the same thing, except we now have someone who's managing your health issues. Got it. Um, if I am not able to communicate to the doctor, hopefully I've said somewhere along the line, you know, Roman, when I get to that point, mm -hmm. I don't want to be kept alive by extraordinary measures. Right. Um, my mom was a 30-year cancer survivor. We had those conversations about quality of life mm. versus quantity of life. Absolutely. Biomedical ethics class I took at San Francisco State University. <laughs> That's cool. Okay. Um, and, you know, at that point, we were just trying to understand 
you know, what would someone want who's been fighting cancer for 30 years? Lots of remission, lots of great years. It's actually a success story. But at some point in time, the body simply can't do it anymore. Mm -hmm. um, would someone want to have the plug pulled? Mm -hmm. Would someone want to not be force-fed? Right. There was a very famous case. I think it was out of Florida, but it went up to the United States Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. um, the young lady's name was Shivo, um, and her husband had instructions from her to do one thing. Her parents had instructions to do another thing, mm -hmm. and the family fought over what this person wanted, and as I recall, she was in a, a vegetative state, right. comatose, minimal response, and they withheld uh, nutrition from her, and she eventually expired. But that was after fighting all the way up to the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. No family needs to have that fight. That's okay, true. If you have the ability now while you're young and mm -hmm. healthy to say, you know, I've thought about these things for whatever reason, I want to put it in writing right. that I want certain health care. I want pain relief. Mm -hmm. I want to be kept alive. Right. Or I don't want these treatments. Right. Uh, and make that very clear. Um, in my practice, when I'm preparing these documents for individuals or for family members, I usually express to them my recommendation that they talk with their family. Right. That they talk with the children, spouse first typically, right. children next, who will have these decisions to make when that person is no longer able. Now, you can also have these documents, for instance, if someone is um, going into the hospital for medical treatment, mm -hmm. and maybe it's an operation, and they're going to be on rehab, and they're going to be out of capacity for a couple weeks. There's a percentage chance there might be complications during the surgery. Right. So they don't have to be a permanent document mm -hmm. uh, in that you're not, I could, you know, I'm, I'm 55, I'm not dropping anytime quick. Right. I'm having an operation. I'm going to give you my authority to do these things for me. Mm -hmm. And then when I'm done with my operation, I'm going to say, hey, we're done. Give me back my powers. And right. so I'm now under control. So there's a few ways to handle these things. But sure. the, the state's planning process. So we established we have the healthcare side of things, the financial side of things. Just using myself as an example, my, my sister is an, an MD. So, you know, if I was my grandfather, my parents, obviously, he says, hey, Roman, for the financial real estate stuff, but obviously Sim's going to make the final car as an MD, which uh, would not be arguable, but um, love my fellow Indians, but everything you just described, uh, it gets 10 times as dramatic and stuff, and, and that's just horrible to have to deal with all that grief during a time of grief sure. um, like that. Um, but one thing, so if we kind of uh, switch, and I apologize sure. if, I, if I cut you off, so let's say we're talking to the typical son, his father has the uh, liquor store, etc. Some of them don't even get across making the huge mistake of not having a CPA, let, let alone creating an S corporation. Uh, one thing that you know we did years back uh, yeah, with you is uh, I kind of want to talk um, about the umbrella shields as um, you know some S corp liability corp, shields. liability. How 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 a trust kind of uh, okay. Well, a trust generally acts as a certain shield. It's not an absolute by any means. There have been cases in California, and I'm sure in other states, where people have mismanaged their trust, underfunded the trust, had uh, you know certain assets one place or another, and then did something to create a liability. And all of a sudden, that liability uh, creates a reason to break the trust. Or failure to update it. Failure to update Oh, you can have the trust be defective. Okay. That's another story. But so the trust acts sort of like a corporation in that when you have a corporation, it's an artificial shield. And if you do it correctly, that you, know, you properly maintain your records, you properly fund the business, it's there. It should be a shield for someone on the outside, for instance, who has been harmed, reaching your personal assets. Mm -hmm. They get to get to the corporate assets. That should be as far as they go. So you can do that in the form of a C Corp, which is a standard California corporation. There is a limited liability corporation, LLC. There is a, a subchapter S corporation, it's more closely hold small businesses. And then there's a limited liability partnership, LLP. All of these structures are business formats. This is how you own a business that can then provide some level of added protection, as opposed to owning a business uh, as a DBA, doing business as. So it's like, you know, Fred's Liquor Shop. 
Mm. Well, it's just that happens to be my liquor shop, and there's no corporate protection there. That's me. That's my business. That's my name on the, the marquee, and that's where we go. And there's pros and cons of each. From Absolutely. But I feel, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, but the pros and cons usually have to do with uh, tax implications, right? And I'm sure your CPA will generally recommend what's best for you, given what your, your structure is. Absolutely. And I've always been taught by my, my men, mentors, you know, growing up that, hey, it'll save you a lot of money in the long run. Your two best friends should always be your CPA, Fred, and your lawyer and your attorney and, and learning from the constantly. But again, that's what most people fail to do is they think they're never going to need Fred. And then they wait till things happen to actually use Fred. And if you're just showing us some of Fred begun, um, people pay him for this kind of free value and knowledge. So we're very lucky uh, uh, to have him. And, and I really appreciate it, um, Fred. So last thing we were talking about was that when somebody, okay, so here's a question for you. Um, if we've purchased a few things since we've done our trust uh, with you, it's important to use you again and update, include those things because those are kind of, if they're other S-Corps, say you added two more stores, um, they're out and free in the open right now until they're added underneath that, correct? Conceivably. So the secret to any business plan, any business structure, any business model, as well as any um, estate planning mm -hmm. is making sure you run it correctly. And by that, I mean, you know, you have a trust. And if you have assets, you need to put the assets into the trust. What does that mean? That means the bank account needs to say the Fred Begun Trust of 2017. That means that those assets are in the trust. The house belongs to the Begun Trust mm -hmm. of 2017. Mm -hmm. Okay? That runs and you're fine. I tell people once they have an estate plan that you have to consider reviewing things. Whenever there has been a major change, that could be a major change in what you have, what you don't have, who you have, who you don't have. You know, you get married, you get divorced, you have children, there are deaths, you buy things, sell things. Mm -hmm. People buy a house, they move on to another house. So long as the, the, the assets, the house, the bank accounts, investment accounts, whatever, are titled in the trust, it's in the trust. Could this be as simple as, sorry to cut you off, changing yeah. banks? As well, you, if you change banks, absolutely, because you're closing an account with one bank, you're opening an account with another mm -hmm. bank, and the knee-jerk reaction of people at these financial institutions, and this is not a knock against the financial institutions, mm -hmm. it's just normal practice. Mm -hmm. Same is true with title companies when it comes to real estate, is they want to gravitate towards the simplest name possible. So that would be putting it in the name of Roman. Mm -hmm. No, we need it in the you know sing family trust right okay consistency you're right now not everything goes in the trust mm -hmm. we need to be very clear about that you can put uh, every everything you have in the trust but a lot of things you may not choose to such as life insurance and retirement accounts because those two types of structures typically are tax um, to, tax tax uh, managed the word, yeah okay yeah. And they usually have designated beneficiaries. Mm -hmm. So there's incentives to pull them out. Okay. However, if that is a place where you have your primary value and you want to manage money downstream, mm -hmm. your children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, mm -hmm. you might decide for that money to go into the trust mm -hmm. so that it becomes a generational gift. Right. And you're building a legacy and passing that legacy forward. Right. Right. So it's very important to, you know, as your life changes, I, I tell people, you know, every five years or so, you should talk to your estate planning attorney, mm -hmm. if for no other reason, to say, hey, has anything changed mm -hmm. that I should consider making any changes to my estate plan? Mm -hmm. And they'll say, tell me, has anything changed? Because yeah. you know your life. Right. Um, if the laws have changed, tax considerations have changed, maybe. Because Congress could change their mind tomorrow, instead of the $5 million exemption for a person, they can go back down to the dark ages and say, oh, $100,000. If you have more than $100,000, we're taxing the hell out of you. Mm -hmm. okay. And things are always going to evolve like that. I think that's right. why someone like yourself is so important. I can be the smartest person in the world, but I need to understand, for example, my, my CPA, that tax is just its simply a different language. Yeah, I can so much. We think we're saving money, but let me just spend time trying to figure it all out. But you got to be humble enough to say that, hey, this is over my head. Let's pay someone because, trust me, the, the penalties and the mishaps will come by not doing that far outweigh the benefits. And I, it always seems like I'm knocking uh, my parents, but 
uh, I have nothing but respect for them. The shirt on my back is because of them. But obviously, your back is because of them. Yes, my back is because of them. But we, you know, we have our, our debates where obviously, you know, they're trying to be uh, save costs wherever they can. But I had to literally drag my dad into your your office. And finally, when we moved uh, into that great. CPA who actually referred us uh, to you, it really changed things for us. Um, and not just that, but we weren't even deducting things correctly where we could get more benefits. Uh, well, in let, that let's way, talk so. about that for a second because that's a key part of my practice. And that is that I do the law. Right. I know a little bit about other things, enough sure. to answer questions and point you to other people mm -hmm. who are the experts. Okay, But my practice is that I try to work with the A-team. I want to work with your team of advisors. If you come to me with a legal question or you're needing an estate plan, I'm going to now say, well, let's talk to your other people, your advisors, your financial advisors, mm -hmm. your real estate advisors, your insurance advisors, your tax advisors. All of these people, all of your advisors that you have right. are, are integral relationships you need because even intelligent people don't know everything. Absolutely. Okay. And I, for example, changed accountants a number of years ago. And anybody who changes accounts, my advice is give your last couple years of taxes to your new CPA. Mm -hmm. Let them look at it. Not only is it good for them to have that information, right. but they'll likely be able to look at it and say, oh, we could have done this differently. Right. We, and now let's go ahead and amend those taxes and get you $1,000 back right. that you didn't have. Cost you $300 with the CPA to do it. Making 700 bucks, probably worth doing. Right. So you, you have these people to rely upon. Your financial advisors, the same thing. And you can only connect the dots looking backwards, right? You cannot connect the dots looking forward. So it's okay. It's very important for you to know. First thing you had me, had me do was the old kind of trust binders not really done well was have mom who does an amazing job of not throwing a single piece of paper away. Uh, probably the key to our success. Uh, and, and bring those into you so you can get a better... Uh, yeah, understanding. And I'll, I'll say the, the people who prepared the trust for your parents did it correctly. Mm -hmm. Everything was okay. It just had its own problems with putting the right things in the right places. Right. So, and, and that's a common mistake. And so it's important to work again with your advisors to do right. the right thing. Right. For instance, you could be talking with your financial advisor. How much money do I need to put into, uh, you know, investments so I can retire at a certain age? Right. How much money can I shelter? Mm -hmm. in an IRA, a Roth IRA, a simple IRA. Uh, you know, if you're an employee, you may have a 401k. If you're in some old world uh, kind of employment, you might even have a pension. Right. They have to look at all these things and they can maximize what you can put away mm -hmm. for the tax benefits that you can get, right. which you also call mm -hmm. your CPA to make sure that your financial advisor and your CPA are on the same page. Right. And then, you know, they do all these things together. Right. And, you know, for investments and whatnot, you have real estate yeah. and you have, you know, those options available, different kind of measure, different kind of return. Right. Okay. And then to protect all that, getting back to an earlier question you had about, you know, what kind of shield can you have? Mm -hmm. The probably best shield you can have would be great insurance. Right. So it's always good to have a good insurance advisor to develop, you know, if you're a homeowner, maybe you're fine with a homeowner's policy, but if you have a couple pieces of property, maybe you're better off having homeowner's policies, and an umbrella policy. Right. That's on the financial side. On the the uh, estate planning side, mm -hmm. then there's the life insurance aspects mm -hmm. to consider. Right. And those have other benefits and burdens. You mm -hmm. have to figure out what you can economically afford to do. But it can also be used as a great tool to create liquidity at the time of your death so that your right. family has real money. Yep. You know, there's a lot of lot of things to consider. The thing that popped into my head is I'm watching way too many uh, forensic files in American Greed, and it always has to do with life insurance policies and the fact that uh, first thing they look at was uh, when any type of murder happens, usually some type of life insurance policy was taken out like a few days before. Yes. Changing uh, the beneficiaries. Yeah, not to be a, a weirdo uh, about that. Uh, I keep making this about myself. I want to remember to make sure I give them value, make it about them. Um, a, a, a scenario would be, um, let's say I'm helping somebody move to Elk Grove. They just executed uh, a loan. Um, it's realistic to say um, out of one of them, husband and wife, husband loses uh, his job, which is totally realistic these days. He's going to go on unemployment. Uh, then he's going to try to find a, a job again. Um, what does this mean for him if he would have got uh, a trust versus not a trust? He's going to work with the bank, try to remodify it. But by doing this, in a nutshell, he almost... Uh, 
protects himself, at least the person has his house, or correct me uh, if, if I'm wrong, that is one way that they can make sure that the bank doesn't try to come after his personal assets? Well, or... the, the trust isn't going to be shielding you from bankruptcy exposures uh, or you know loans to, to the bank, anything of that nature. Because you have an agreement with them. You still have to honor your contracts. Uh, the trust is just the person, the entity, that holds the property in your name. Right. Okay? So um, it is, it's uh, really just more of a tool for passing the property. Uh, as well as holding the property. It's not going to be some sort of sword to cut liability. Right. Okay. You still have to honor oh, yeah. your contracts. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But I wouldn't be ethical on your part. Yeah. Right. But it's this it's the, the, the safe way to own the property for the purposes of passing it to your family and uh, maximizing or if it's what you can. A business and not a personal property. That's true. That would help. Um, and so, so let's say I just explained Joe's situation, Joe's in that situation. What type of advice uh, would you give to him? He's you know, two years in, just finally made that move with his wife and kids from renting to this huge house. Boom, this happens out of nowhere. Obviously, the first person he should talk to is probably uh, the bank that they worked with and work out the deal. Um, what would you off the bat? Let's say if this is your son coming to you for advice. Yeah. Um, first, I would tell them I'm not going to give them any money. No, <laughs> just kidding. Um, no, I mean, that's a realistic situation, and we were seeing that a lot 2008, 2009, 2010, Absolutely. and in California, it began to tail off. Other parts of the country that dragged for a few more years. Um, but if we're looking at a situation where, let's say, you've moved, you've owned a property for a couple of years, so there's not a lot of equity that you built up, uh, the market has done whatever the market has done, and mm. um, you lose your job, okay, you sort of have to look at it, I consider, holistically by saying, okay, what's the story on the family? So you said some important things. There's a wife, there's children. Um, is the wife working? Yes or no. Uh, how much money do we have coming in? Okay, can we still float for how long? Do we have six months of emergency funds? Well, then you talk to your financial advisor and right. say, well, where do we have? What money do I have? Um, this, these are liquid assets that I can draw upon. These are retirement assets that I cannot draw upon. Um, there are certain retirement structures that you can borrow against. Mm -hmm. If you have like a 401k, mm -hmm. uh, so there's certain opportunities there. That becomes like step three. That's an emergency move because you don't want to create debt right. to pay debt. Um, Explore all those options first before you even think of. Yeah. So you're, you're talking, you know, while you're obviously you know, going online, going on mm -hmm. LinkedIn, doing mm -hmm. Facebook business, whatever, mm -hmm. and trying to get as many leads as you can and yeah, find employment. To get a job okay. again. So you always keep that going. That yeah. iron is permanently in the fire. Right. And if you're prudent, even when you have a job, that right. iron's in the fire. You're just not stoking it a lot. Right. And th there could be, realistically, a few people are going through this right now. I'm so happy they tuned in. Absolutely. That out. Um, so, you know, you, you would look at it from that level before you get to any kind of panic mode. Um, obviously, uh, you know, four people in a family, husband, wife, two children, you have a pretty good burn rate. Right. And the ages of the children make differences on, on that story. Um, but there are ways to work through that. Then when you have an idea as to what your cash flow models might be, you know, you talk to the bank, see if there's opportunities to restructure, pause, uh, interest only payments. Mm -hmm. There are certain things that you could do to stretch time. Right. And banks don't want to own property. Mm -hmm. They're in the business to make money on money. Okay, and when all Keyword these banks, interest. you know, yeah, you know, that's that's their job, right? And if they own property that they foreclosed upon, they're not making money on it. Mm. Okay, it's just sitting there; it's not gaining anything for them, um, but for maybe the market value is changing. Mm -hmm. But then they've got to list it, sell it, clean it up, do these things. So, really, when when people started, you know, going crazy at banks for doing it, banks were doing the contracts. They didn't want the houses. They didn't want the property. But they'd rather have the property than nothing, so that's Absolutely. why they took the property. And that's why my apologies to get you up. I was talking to my, my client about this as well. Is even though we're in the pre-approval stage, yes. Uh, one of the I think the responsibilities of me and actually working for my commission, not just taking it, is talking about these type of realistic, realistic scenarios. And instead of waiting and then calling that bank right now, making sure that I even help out 
negotiate with them. Okay, well, we're at 3% uh, when we see the final documents, reviewing them. And then obviously the very last step right before we close escrow, I even do recommend to them to reaching out to a person like yourself to look, if we're looking at final agreements, at least glancing at them. They don't have to be a part of the entire uh, uh, process, but starting from the very beginning and making sure that it's not an adjustable mortgage rate, that it's yeah. something fixed, um, that it's locked or not locked. Well, there's there's um, a lot of attorneys out there that you know are more than willing to assist people, maybe have a simple consultation, to review documents that live in the land of legalese. Yeah. Um, you know, last time I bought a house, there was, oh, I don't know, somewhere between an inch and two inches of paper. Mm -hmm. Okay. No one's going to read that. Right. And you're told to just check the corner that you've read it. Some people will try to read it and they'll not understand half of it because it's going to be arcane language. language. Yeah. Um, so it's always good to consult with someone. Now, a, a qualified licensed realtor and or broker, mm -hmm. two different people, mm -hmm. two different tasks, you know, can walk through these things with you and explain in a little more of a layman's term, mm -hmm. this is what it means, right. okay? Yeah. And there's a lot of things that are really, I would say, unnecessary to know. You're really focusing more on making sure that you have the correct terms of mm -hmm. your deal and making sure that all the title work has been done so that, you know, you know that we're getting a good, clean property. That's the job of the escrow officer. Mm -hmm. You know, so you do some things of that nature just to make it work, mm -hmm. okay? But, you know, I think it's important throughout the life of a real estate negotiation before you get the property and put it into your trust right? Um, to make sure that the deal is still good. Um, years ago when I bought my, my second home, my first home in San Jose, mm -hmm. um, I was looking to move from Santa Cruz, and I had my house sold, so I had a certain amount of money, and I got into a bidding war on a property. I'm like, why am I paying extra for this house when right. I can go find something else? Now it was different. The market it, was different. It's like that now as well, yeah. uh, especially with it being uh, making sure I back up some recording. Yeah. But keep going. But it's one of those things that you know you can get yourself um, a little heated up with the feel of the auction. Mm -hmm. Okay, and now you're getting yourself stretched right. into a bad deal because you know the more you you pay, either the more you have to come up with, so right. you're coming out of your savings and down payment or the more that you're borrowing, mm -hmm. which means your payment goes up right. and your interest goes up. And if you look at the truth in lending mm -hmm. statements that come when you're doing your house, mm -hmm. you're buying a house for a couple hundred thousand dollars, and by the time your 30-year mortgage is up, you paid a million dollars for a $200,000 house. Yeah. It's probably not the correct numbers, right, but no. you get the idea. But but emotion versus logic, one of the coolest books I read, Art of Persuasion, we're crazy mammals where we know what the logic is, but we will always choose the emotional factor over little things that will continue to bid ourselves up and then later realize that I have that buyer's remorse yeah. and so forth. So those are all totally, totally realistic things. Uh, I want to make sure because you probably don't even know the time is flying. Uh, we're probably at about 35 minutes. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Oh, so let's yeah. see. I, I've written here, uh, boast Fred's awesome bl blueprint forms and differentiate and why that's so uh, important. And what I, I mean for, for that is just to give people a realistic idea where, um, you know, if something ever did happen to mom and dad, this is me observing from afar when you went through the process with, with my mom and dad, that literally there's there's so many things that you don't even think of um, at the time. And, and God forbid, let's say we all get wiped out um, on a trip to, uh, you know, Arizona. Um, but then that aunt who may not even have been in our house uh, in years has no idea what to do or how to go about things and what this allows and this is everything that's going on in my crazy mind um, this allows you to literally through uh, the way Fred's done this for so many years that he has blueprints that allows that hey go to this sock drawer for this thing <laughs> on this jewelry thing and I know I was blown away by that because it made me feel so good and to be honest we should have paid you uh, way more. Let me be transparent about that because I think that's invaluable um, later on down the line. I mean, we're talking, you know, uh, generations of, so let's say, just grandma's jewelry, even if it's a small item, it, the emotional data of that is, is huge and um, the realistic, that doesn't cross our mind. And it's not being negative, it's you, you have to be realistic in that way. Well, you know, and one of the hardest things for estate planning attorneys 
is that you're talking to people about a very happy topic called death. <laughs> and nobody wants to talk about it. Right. And so people don't even think about how to think about it. Right. And so the idea of how do I manage my documents? Wh who knows about my documents, you know, which are important to have before death, mm -hmm. you know, like the healthcare directive and like the power of attorney, so that someone knows who's in charge. Right. Um, knowing where those are, having multiple copies of them, having the people that are going to be in charge aware of them if they don't already have copies of them, mm -hmm. and then having simple directions as to, you know, how to manage this, how to do that, and, or who it's, knows. It's not about being selfish that somebody's trying to take your stuff that people might initially uh, get that way. It's actually being responsible that you took care of things that you don't want to be the burden, like you mentioned earlier, on everybody else. I think that's far more respectable uh, versus that, that other thought of, uh, yeah, let me just, you know, when I go, I go, and, and that's it. But it, it wouldn't be fair to so many others who have to kind of bear that, that burden. Uh, let me go down this real quick and see if there's any other, because any one of these topics we can talk for, for days on. Um, and, I mean, I know you talked about real estate construction for a while. The reason I put for sale by owners and disclosures is I read a lot about, okay, well, why am I becoming a, a, a realtor? A lot of people try to jump in and they, they say, well, I can sell this myself. And soon they learn at the end of the day, it's all about marketing, the marketing power for getting uh, the best price. But on top of that, from a le legal aspect, which I, I'm not an uh, expert in, we can also make costly mistakes like, you know, not uh, you know, selling a house to somebody, not signing the right disclosure forms, and then them then ending up suing you later, would you say? Or what's a very common thing you see? Well, um, the biggest problem when I was doing real estate work really was a failure of disclosure. Now, a good realtor basically will be filling out all these forms with you and will be asking you, do you know about this? Do you know about that? Mm -hmm. Has anybody died in the house? Has something happened to the house? Mm -hmm. Things that people don't think about. I even had a case where it was not disclosed that the uh, unmarked building next door was actually a halfway house. So people that had gotten out of jail that are doing rehab usually for, you know, substance issues. Right, right. And it was right next door to someone who was basically looking to buy the house to move in there with their children. Now, we all want to be optimistic that life is good and there's no problems, mm -hmm. but that's a kind of disclosure failure mm -hmm. that a person selling the house themselves might realize, might not realize they have an obligation to share information. Even if it's not on paper, but at least verbally share it. On, well, you I want it on, it on paper, paper so you can prove yeah. that you did disclose it. My, right? The realtors that I worked with that were my clients in, in Santa Cruz, they disclosed everything. They did it all on paper. They had the CYA nailed, and they never were nailed as a result. Mm. Okay, so you cross your T's, you dot your I's, you wear your belt, you wear your suspenders just so that nothing bad happens. Right. And if you practice at the highest level possible, mm -hmm. it's not that much of an effort. Mm -hmm. And you will hopefully never be in the wrong. And you might be dealing with a veteran on the other side who's smiling and just, I can't wait to just take advantage of this aspect. Like, what a Perhaps. Rookie. What a rookie. Let's, ha let's have some fun with this, right? Let's yeah. have fun. Total sidetrack, but real quick, Santa Cruz, word on the street, is they don't let you rent them out after you buy them? What's up, what's up with that? Is that accurate? Um, I'm not sure. Okay. I haven't practiced over there in a while. I know some people that have Airbnbs. Yes, so yes. there may be some some so limitations. Like Airbnb. Oh, okay. It could be grandfathered. I don't know this this kind of practice of uh, part time rental, mm. not buying a place to rent it to you know, lease it out. Mm. There's a little difference, and so it's an evolving area of law. Got it. Got or it. actually, it's not even evolving area of law. It's an evolving area of government code, mm. and government regulation. My old boss from Toshiba just generally mentioned that because he got a vacation home right in front. Uh, do you know why exactly, what's their method behind their madness uh, with that? Uh, so they're anti-long-term, they're okay with the Airbnb weekend type thing. Actually, it's, it, yeah. for the most part, it's the other way around. The other way around. They're okay, okay with long-term because they don't want to have ah. a, a residential neighborhood with people moving in and moving out all the time. Constantly. Okay. It's, it's a stability issue. It's a control and safety issue. Mm. Okay, You don't know who's point. coming. That's fair point. You know, um, not, not that we have to be paranoid, but in an era of neighborhood watch, mm -hmm. um, you sort of want to have stability to know everyone on your street. Mm -hmm. And if someone's coming every week, you Party don't... Party it up, trash the place, well, and leave. Yeah. It's a tourist town. It's a completely yeah. tourist yeah. town. Yeah, you never know. So it's, you have to, if you're buying property for investment purposes, mm -hmm. you have to make sure you do your work behind that. 
have a realtor who knows how to do their work behind that to know what's the general rules in this area. Mm -hmm. Okay. Again, um, my understanding is long-term rental anywhere is not a problem. It's the short-term rentals that you have to be careful because there's a bunch of companies. Airbnb is just the one that everyone talks about, but there's several other companies that do that kind of rental, um, temporary rental kind of situation. They're, it's a growing industry. Right. When there's growth, there's change. When there's change, there'll be litigation. But we'll right. deal with that down the road, too. Right, right. Uh, one perfect thing, and I swear I didn't plan this, was um, I kind of created a simple 10-step guide on how to buy a house, but I wanted to break up each step um, every day. I was putting that video. It just so happened we're on step five today, which is uh, writing an offer. And that is why uh, I saw Jim Meech as well, and just so happened that uh, I saw you now in the real estate world, the residential real estate mm -hmm. world, that usually they all go by Realtors Association's generic forms. Uh, and there's so many different ones. They're always updated. They're kind of, now they're automated online and people forget to check certain check boxes and agents can't get their commission, which is one thing I kept hearing in my first couple um, months. Is there anything that jumps out to you? Because obviously in the commercial world, we can go through someone like yourself and they can be as extravagant as you want them to be. But typically in the residential world, they want you to use generic forms according to, you know, Santa Clara County Village Association has their own, San Francisco will have um, their own. As far as going about writing an offer, is there any advice you have or any common mistakes that you might see? Are you okay with the generic forms for any typical family? Well, you know, and again, I haven't practiced this area of law in a while. Sure, sure. My default position would be go back to the California Association of Realtors. Okay. Okay. That's for California. Mm -hmm. There is county-specific variations, I'm sure. Between those two, your specific county and the state, you're going to be the most covered uh, as far as what needs to be in there mm -hmm. or what's the possibilities. Um, you don't want to have a lot of deviation from the standard forms exactly unless you have a really unique property and there's some special concern right. or perhaps some special financing concern. Got it. So keep it simple, stupid. Yeah, that's okay. exactly uh, what you'll see with Jim. I mentioned what if the other party wants a specific clause within these real associated forms. That's where Jim says, well, that's when you start writing things in, especially when the residential world, that's when you really end up screwing up and things get uh, messy. And then my response was, you know, keep it, keep it simple. Right. Kiss, Kiss the acronym I, Kiss. I, I always use. Uh, and there's a method to their madness. So the halfway house guy, when you were reviewing these, they came to you for the case. You were looking at standard, uh, you know, fill form from yeah. it's totally typical practice. Um, so making an offer, obviously, would. Uh, the st as far as step number five is concerned, going through those you know, zip forms, I think we're using now, and obviously using the latest and making sure everything's filled out. <laughs> well, and quite honestly, there's always a pressure mm -hmm. to be in there with your offer. Get it in there quick. Get it in at the right dollar amount. Right. You know, have the least amount of contingencies. Okay, fine. I understand that pressure, but you need to do it correctly. You need to um, not be rushed. Because if you rush, you will make mistakes. Something will be missed. Mm -hmm. If there is something weird going on in the story, usually the realtors will communicate, the seller's realtor and the buyer's realtor will have some communication about what's going on. If nothing else, they'll say, well, I have three other offers already, and the highest is for X dollars. Mm -hmm. Hopefully you have a good relationship. You can trust that that's a true number. Right. But for any young realtors in particular, you all have compliance people or brokers at your agency that you work with, don't be afraid to bark it upstream and say, hey, does this sound right? Because that way at least you're making sure you're getting the best education you can for the specific circumstance. Mm -hmm. You're doing the best job you can for your client. Uh, Fred, that's where we'll wrap it up here. And I think a perfect thing to wrap up on is I even said it myself, and this gentleman in our office that we talked about is he said, you know, contingencies, contingencies, contingencies is on the top. Uh, buyer mistakes, a video I made on top of seller mistakes was I uh, never go in it without any contingencies. To somebody who has no idea what the hell a contingency means, uh, could you just sum it up for us? Uh, maybe maybe an example of what a sure. contingency is and how that's important. So the most common contingency is the nature of financing. So I will buy the house and I will pay $1 million cash. 
In other words, I'm writing a check for $1 million. Someone might say, I'm buying the house for $1,000,000, 100000 but I'm getting financing. Meaning so 100000 down. One, yeah, 100000 down, meaning I'm getting financing for $900,000. And so it's contingent upon my financing being approved. If my financing doesn't come through, my offer is worthless. Okay, so that's the kind of thing um, for a seller's perspective, clearing all the inspections, that the roof is solid, that there's no termite problem, which in California, if the house has wood, there will be a termite problem. Just Absolutely. know it. Okay, and that's common. Mm -hmm. Don't don't sweat it. Just you know. So there's certain housing inspections that will have to be approved. So those as those inspections are done, those contingencies are lifted. So there's certain things that are basically, but for this happening, I'm in the deal. Mm -hmm. If this thing happens, the deal is done. Right. It, it, deal is dead. Okay. So getting those contingencies uh, lifted is part of moving the deal forward, getting them satisfied or lifted. Um, or if they break down, then you have to figure out, am I still good to go? Right. Do I care? Right. And if you didn't have those contingencies later on when you find out XXX problem and you come back and say, hey, well, I, I, didn't, I didn't know how to do this. Now I have to fix this. Let's pay for this. Exactly. Uh, they would simply say, well, hey, you should have added some contingencies. And, uh, and that's important, I think, for our job to make sure our clients are also satisfied, too, because uh, they, you know, they're going to be wondering, well, I wasn't taking care of it. It's never them, but it's also my job to understand, educate, and protect people. I think that's how I personally differentiate value. Uh, yep. Man, every time uh, Fred and I talk, it's always a, a pleasure, sir. I, I'm in, de in debt to you, um, and, and I know that even uh, one person that actually uh, you know, heard one little thing that could have changed something for him, I think that was worth it, and good karma um, on our end. So. Um, appreciate everything, Fred. And, uh, My pleasure. And Fred's going to be around, I know, on my end for life. But um, what I'll do is uh, we have another version that I'll post uh, on YouTube for people to pause and rewind. In, uh, in the description, I'm going to uh, list all of, of Fred's contact information if you guys want to get a hold of him. And, and remember, a few hundred dollars of creating something like a trust or working uh, with Fred to get it done, you know, depending on how complicated your issue is. I'm not saying you charge a few hundred dollars uh, can, you know, mean hundreds of thousands. Um, and, and again, it's better to have a long-term relationship than a transactional relationship with someone like Mr. Regan, as well as uh, your CPA or tax professional. So, well, let me let me throw one thing in, just as a last sales pitch. Absolutely. Okay. Um, should you have any need for my services yes. after seeing this, uh, you want to come on in for a consultation. I normally have a consultation fee, but if you say Roman sent me, <laughs> okay, I'll cut that fee in half. So we'll save you a, a few bucks along the way. So okay. there you go. Now it's good for you to know Roman. He just saved you money. I appreciate that. That's <laughs> awesome. awesome energy. My fellow Gator, thank you guys that. for tuning in. Uh, if you if you missed us, uh, don't worry. It'll be up on YouTube. So cheers, guys. Fred and Roman signing out. Bye-bye. Okay. Amazing. That Fine. was cool. Okay. 2017 just made a lot of millennials happy. Yeah. <laughs> Something like that. Okay. Well, hopefully. Uh, so, um. You know, send me the links on that. Yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll put it, it up on, li on LinkedIn, and I'll send you a personal email with everything uh, uh, too. And um, I like throwing in the subtitles in there for fun because people might be hearing impaired, and just oh. by you doing that, they feel that hey, you know, they they thought about me, right? At least uh, I'm not signing in the background. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Cool. Very cool, Fred. Okay. That's a, that's a hell of a way to end. A